to um, to the part one of a two part workshop. Um, you don't necessarily have to come to part two, but if you registered, they will build on each other. My name is John Little and uh, I am the data science librarian. I work in the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences, which is a center embedded in the Duke University Library. One of the things about the R community is it tends to be very helpful. And normally if we were meeting face to face, I would tell you to introduce yourself to your neighbor because you might want to ask them, you know, for a little clarification. But we don't, we can't really do that so well in in Zoom. Uh, so it's part of this is up to you. But I shared with you all the resources in advance because um, it makes it easier, I think, to sort of get a big chunk of R presented to you, even if it doesn't all make sense initially. It will eventually come together. Um, you can rewatch the videos. Uh, there is a full recording of this workshop at the end of the YouTube playlist, which is in the R Fund site. I'll cover that. Um, so uh, let's get started. I always like to start by reading this land acknowledgement. So if you will just give me your kind hearted attention, I will read this now. I'd like to take a moment to honor the land in Durham, North Carolina. Duke University sits on the ancestral land of the Shikori, the Eno, and the Catawba people. This institution of higher learning is built on land stolen from those peoples. These tribes were here before the colonizers arrived. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of the enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. Recognizing this history is an honest attempt to break out beyond persistent patterns of colonization and to rewrite the erasure of indigenous and black peoples. There is value in acknowledging the history of our occupied spaces and places. I hope we can glimpse, glimpse an understanding of these histories by recognizing the origins of collective journeys. Okay, so I thank you for your attention on that. We are not, this is obviously not a class on social justice and we may not talk about any social justice issues here. It's mostly gonna be about the nuts and bolts of using R in a reproducible manner. But um, I like to read that and acknowledge that. And I simply ask that if you are faced with areas of injustice, maybe something you learn here today will help you rectify those issues that we all face. Okay, another thing to mention is that as I, as I sent you, you should have gotten an email from me in advance. This is a flipped workshop. So I send a whole bunch of material in advance that you can review. And if you review it and attempt the, the questions, it will help you clarify what questions you have. And so I'm gonna reserve some time after I do the initial introduction. For those people who've done that prep work, I'm gonna privilege them and ask them, do you have questions that are specifically on the material? I'll also ask that questions be centered on the material shared. Well, the best way to learn R is to apply what you're learning to your specific research project. Please recognize that um, the rest of the people in this webinar, they don't actually have your data. They may not have your background on your discipline. And so it doesn't really help the group to focus on a specific issue that's not broadly applicable. However, that's what we have consultations for, and I am more than happy to meet with you and help you customize your R learning plan specifically to your work. Um, and I'll also make the recommendation that after you leave today's webinar, one of the best ways to uh, further and reinforce your learning is to take a very simple project, not a complex project, but a simple project that you, where you know the data, you understand the research process, and you may have done it in a different tool, maybe Tableau or maybe uh, Excel or maybe Python or maybe Stata. Take that project and then just try and replicate it in R and that will help bring into high relief the things that you don't quite yet understand but you're pretty certain can be done and it'll help you figure out what kind of questions you wanna ask me, um, possibly in a consultation. Now, I also like to mention that for the most part, this is what I call an eat your own dog food presentation. And what I mean by that is I'm gonna try and model using R in a research process, uh, using a reproducible research workflow to demonstrate what R can do. So basically everything that I'm presenting here today, including the slides has been generated in R. 
uh, the you know an exception being, for example, the workshop is hosted in Zoom and the preparation email got sent out over Outlook and and the survey was done in in uh, Google Forms. But then R can orchestrate the data that Google Forms collects by reading in the Google Forms spreadsheet. And then you can manipulate the data that way. And the whole thing is a reproducible process where I can simply essentially press play. And if I get new data in, the slides update themselves relevant to the data that I have at the time. So I'm gonna try and again, model what R can do for you. Now this first slide here is simply telling you where are you all coming from, right? Um, so we're looking at a um, stacked bar chart on a slide deck that was generated in R. And you can just see that we've got folks from public policy, school of medicine, biology, the health system, engineering, computer science. And it looks like psychology. I didn't make that um, abbreviation. Um, I think it's psychology and neurology, um, neuroscience. And um, another thing that R does that does really well um, is you can, if you can generate a graph that has, you know, with one line of code, you can alter that graph. So I can turn each one of these academic statuses into a subgraph uh, by one line of code in ggplot, which we'll learn about more tomorrow, where that one line of code is called a faceted wrap, where I can take this bar chart and create a facet for each one of these academic statuses. So if I go to the next slide, you can see that there. It's not necessarily the best visualization in the world, but it's a nice way to get a different view and it demonstrates one of the things that R can do for you. So minimal uh, manipulation of your data and maximal uh, flexibility with respect to the reports that you're generating. Uh, this is data collected from the survey that I send out in advance where I ask, what kinds of skill sets are you bringing to this workshop? Um, and this is a pretty typical um, curve for how people respond to, to the survey. Um, just a simple, by the way, it's just a simple, what's called a time series graph. ggplot does a great job of generating time series graphs, not particularly difficult to do. Um, a few crazy little tw uh, tricks and tips that you might wanna know about. But here is a proportional bar graph where I'm asking, you know, what kind of experience are you bringing to this workshop? And it's a convenient survey. It's not, it's not a means tested, uh, pre-tested, purely uh, well done social science survey, but it gives me an idea of what people are bringing. And when, one of the things you can see here is that, um, and this is typical too, we have some people who are coding quite a bit weekly and daily, and then we have a number of people who are not coding so much. So if we can all be um, generous to each other, we'll, we'll, we may have to cover things that we already know, but um, hopefully we'll get to things that you are interested in. I also ask questions about version control and command line interfaces and databases, because all of those things have a um, stake in how you do reproducible work. Um, I have workshops on nearly all of these things that you can refer to, and I'll tell you how you can get to those. Um, they also all um, can be, for example, databases, they can all be orchestrated in R. So you can use R to connect to other relational databases. You can subset data in the database and then pull back smaller subsets, all that kind of stuff. We won't cover all of that today, but I want you to be aware that it's possible. Um, this is the bulk of what we're going to talk about today, right? We're going to talk about importing data, editing scripts, and subsetting data. A huge, uh, large portion of, of you all who answered this survey feel very comfortable with that, but many people do not. So we'll try and cover that well. I'm going to talk about projects and reproducibility. Those are they're difficult pro uh, concepts to, to convey clearly in the time allotted. So I'm not gonna go into them in great depth, but I would appreciate if you feel and then other useful links, right? This R fun link is just a collection of all kinds of modules to learning about R. And then of course, our center's homepage. If I click on this one, um, I'll just give you a quick tour. There's a whole bunch of modules here. Like if you wanna learn more about mapping or if you wanna learn how to make slides or how to use Git, with R, uh, each, almost all of those have 
video recordings, shareable data, slides, that kind of thing. Feel free to scroll through those. You would have already seen or may have already seen the page that supports this today's workshop and tomorrow's workshop. It has some embedded videos. It has a whole bunch of links to additional parts of information about using R. So something I covered, I got covered it too quickly or you're coming back to it two or three months from now and you want a refresher on joins and merges or using assignments and pipes, you can find these shorter videos. They're almost all under 10 minutes or roughly. There's also a link to a YouTube playlist which has all of those videos plus the full workshops recorded at some earlier time of part one and part two, roughly equivalent to today and tomorrow. And uh, let's see. Okay, a little bit about good ways to get help in R. Um, the R community is actually known for being very helpful. There are lots of good places to get help. People post questions to places called Stack Exchange. I don't know if you've ever heard of Stack Exchange, but you can post questions to there. They also have a um, R specific kind of Stack Exchange place that if you Google the phrase R Studio Community, uh, you'll get there. Very helpful people there. Um, also, there is a Slack channel called R for Data Science. Uh, I'm not sure what you would, I mean, maybe you could Google that and get to it. Um, and if you want to find it and, and you can't find it, just reach out to me and I'll send you the information. Uh, but very helpful community, always trying to answer questions, but also they've developed a uh, kind of best practice that they promote called a reprex or a reproducible example. And the whole idea is to post your question in a way that entices an efficient, relatively quick answer. And you do that by limiting your question to the to the important part, right? So there's a website that you can read and there's even a package that can help you make a reprex. But the idea is, is that you're sharing the simplest, smallest data possible. In fact, if you can use a built-in data set, which we're gonna do a lot of today, you don't even have to share your data because it's easier to uh, give an example when everybody's looking at the same data. And then you share the code only on a need to run basis, right? What generates the error or problem that you're seeing? So I understand since we're all in an intro course here, um, you may not how to know how to do all of those steps. And I'm totally sympathetic to that. I'm very sympathetic to people who are new to R because it's a lot to take in. It feels like it's a big learning curve. And if you're getting overwhelmed at some point, I, I just would, would suggest to you, hang in there. It'll get better. It starts to fall into place. And if you don't even, if you're feeling overwhelmed even by this idea of a reprex, don't let it get you down. Just shoot me a note. We'll figure something out. But the idea is uh, I'm not always available. I mean, you, know, you might be doing your homework at three in the morning and I'm hopefully asleep. Um, but if you can reduce your question to something that's simple to respond to, you're more likely to get a response. Um, put another way, of the people who like to be helpful in R, nobody wants to get a thousand lines of code from somebody that says, you know, there's something wrong with the third subroutine. I'm just not sure what's wrong, right? You need to put a little bit of effort into localizing the problem and clarifying just the things that are not right. Uh, we're not going to talk about that much more, but um, it's something to keep in mind. Now, as a way of introducing some things that I often get a lot of questions about, I'm going to talk about pipes and assignments, right? Uh, we'll put these into practice in a minute. But an assignment operator looks like this. It's a less than symbol and a dash, and you can generate it on your uh, R keyboard in R, in R Studio if you simply type the Alt dash key. Now we'll talk about this more, but you can read this sort of mnemonically as gets value from. So in R, you could type a very simple expression like five times five. And of course the answer to that would be 25. And then you could assign that answer to an object name. So in this case, my object name is answer. And I might read this data sentence as saying, answer gets value from five times five. Okay, there are actually four other op uh, assignment operators in R. Um, but by convention, for the most part, this is the operator that's used to assign the output of an expression into an object name. 
Um, the other conventions that, that's used a lot is the equal sign, the single equal sign. And that tends to be used more, at least in the convention that we're gonna learn about today, that's used more when it's assigning something inside of another function, right? So I'm using a mutate function, I'm taking the, va the value of answer, which I assigned up here, multiplying that by two, so 25 times two is 50, and I'm assigning that to an object name called answer to. So mutate a new variable called answer to, which gets value from answer times two. All right, so that's the takeaway right there. This alt dash is just a, what's called an assignment variable. You're gonna see that more and more today. So if it doesn't make sense right now, don't worry. The other thing you're gonna see a lot of is this thing called a pipe, which is a conjunction, which essentially allows you to compose a data sentence. Some people will call this whole thing a pipe. I tend to call it a data sentence. And you can uh, generate that with a command or a control shift M. And it generates this. You can also just type it out by hand, percent greater than percent. Um, you can mnemonically think of that as saying, and then. So answer, and then take the square root of answer. And notice that different from the previous answer, in the previous slide, we had already assigned, assigned that a value of 25. So if we took the square root of that, this would respond, the console would respond with the value five, right? Um, if we were gonna also assign this to an object name, the console would not respond. Hopefully you'll see that more, but notice here, we're assigning this output to an object name. So it's just gonna go into the object name. Here, we're not assigning the output to anything. So it's just going, the answer is going to appear. All right, you'll see more of that. Couple definitions to help us set the groundwork for what we're gonna talk about. R is a data first programming language, it has a mature sense of the data lifecycle, and it really helps if you're trying to have a reproducible workflow, all right? It's not the only tool that can do that, but um, as a data first programming, programming language, I wanna contrast it with Python. Now, largely Python and R sort of do the same thing. There's almost nothing that you can do in Python that you can't do in R or vice versa. Uh, the sort of functional differences, Python is more of a general programming language, whereas R is more of an analytical data first pro programming language. I think R fits a little bit better into the academy, but either tool would be fine. Um, Another way to think of it is if you're analyzing, if you're analyzing numbers, if you're doing some kind of statistical analysis or other kind of analysis and generating reports, R is great for that. Python might have an advantage if you're making phone apps or something like that. I don't, I don't actually, I've never heard of anybody make a phone app in R. I'm sure you could do it, uh, but it's not really the workflow that sort of naturally flows into R. There is, however, a tool that's really good for making web applications that works well with R. It's called Shiny. We're not going to talk about that today, but you'll at least have heard the word here. Um, so R is the programming language or the language interpreter. R Studio, which is the tool we're going to use to manipulate R, is really what's called an IDE or an uh, integrated development environment. It's just a mask or an application that sits on top of R that makes it easier to program. And then we're gonna learn a particular dialect of R today called the tidyverse. It's uh, one of many ways to use R. Uh, you don't have to, many people just prefer to use what's called base R. The tidyverse is sort of the most modern, one of the more modern approaches to using R. And what it really is, is a collection of packages that all work well together, that are all documented basically in a similar fashion uh, so that, if you um, know one part of the tidyverse, it's a little bit easier to get up to speed with another package in the tidyverse. Now, you'll notice in the definition here, it says it's an opinionated system of packages. So the tidyverse people recognize that they have an opinion. They're saying, this is a nice, easy, consistent way to use R. This is our opinion. If you don't like our opinion, you know, feel free to use a different approach. But in today's approach, I'm gonna show you the tidyverse. I think it's easier to learn. I also think that it's a little more modern, leans a little bit more into sort of a data science approach than a pure statistical approach. And that makes it useful for generating reports and slides and websites, and eBooks and all kinds of stuff. Really nice approach. Um, 
But if you're very comfortable with base R and just looking for a little refresher, you may learn some new things here. Uh, what you will not get from me is a statement that says you must use the tidyverse. It's just, that's what I'm gonna teach. But if you're comfortable with R, base R and you wanna stick with that, uh, you know, that's all good as far as I'm concerned. Now that phrase tidyverse comes about because of a paper. There's a link to that paper right now by a guy named Hadley Wickham, who is the chief information science officer at our studio. And he wrote this paper. He's also like, I think, formerly st stats professor. Um, he wrote this paper called T about tidy data, which lays out some very specific um, concepts about how you would lay out your data for easy iteration and to imply and embed some grammatical meaning to your data set. It basically boils down to every column is a variable, every row is an observation, and the values are the intersections thereof. And it tends to mean that you have what's called tall data rather than wide data. Now, if anybody here is coming at this from the perspective of pandas, uh, Python, you may have heard of the uh, package called pandas, which comes out of this concept called panel data. Either one of them are fine, uh, but in a tidyverse concept, you know, we're just gonna lean into the tidy, tall, long data approach rather than the wide data approach. But there are tools to pivot your data either way because one size doesn't fit all. And even the tidyverse recognizes that, right? Say tidy data is a nice container for your data. Most of the time, it's very flexible, can be very easy to iterate. But if you need wide data, then we're gonna make wide data. If you need to push your data into a database, a relational database management system, then we're gonna allow you, to enable you to do that. If you wanna read more about that, you can. All right, so I'm just about to get ready to sort of dive in, but I just wanna clarify what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about reproducibility, our studio projects and literate coding. And then the guts of it that we're gonna spend the rest of the time today doing is subsetting data talking about those five deplier verbs that are things like mutate and select and uh, mutate, select, filter, group by, summarize, that kind of stuff. So we'll come back to that. Um, so just one more definition, reproducibility, it's uh, obtaining computational results using the same input data, computational steps, methods, codes, conditions of analysis. This is an increasingly important approach as we have, as we continue on this sort of long, journey of a computer revolution that we're all, we find we're all using computers all the time. You really want to avoid those situations where you've done a project and then you look back at it from six months ago and you go, I have no idea how I generated all those formulas, right? That is actually a pretty common um, reaction, particularly to people who are using Excel, which was a, a great innovative tool when it first came out and it's still a very useful tool but Excel was developed to make it really easy to kind of bumble through what you want to do. It was never really designed to make it really clear how you did what you were going to do. And that becomes problematic in research because at some point someone's going to ask you essentially show your work. And if you're doing your work in a reproducible fashion, it's super simple to show your work. It just becomes your workflow and then you can just point to it. So in order for us to do reproducible work, one of the things we're going to do, I'm going to introduce to you this idea of RStudio projects. In the upper right-hand corner of RStudio, you'll see in just a minute, you can create new projects, a discrete folder for every project that you're working on. And it just makes it easier to share that one folder, you can share that folder with somebody else. And you don't have to rewrite in any code. They don't have to rewrite any code in order to run that RStudio project. For those of you who are used to base R, this means no longer using set WD, which is not a very, it's not a reproducible process at all. Um, it makes things very endemic to your particular file system. So I'm gonna recommend against using set WD uh, and I'm gonna recommend against using RM lists equals LS. I'm not gonna define those uh, because they're not super important. Uh, but if you use those, if that's part of your workflow, you know, let me help you move beyond that. Um, and then another nice thing about RStudio is it integrates well with Git, which is used for version control. I have a workshop on that. We won't talk about it much today. Um, Charlie writes, John, I am right at the beginning of this. Is there an online glossary of these terms? Um, 
Well, I just defined some and they're in the slides and I'm gonna share the slides with you. But if you wanna just put in a word that I've mentioned that's not clear, I'd be more than happy to give you another definition. The other thing I would say is for everything that I'm gonna, I shouldn't say for everything, but for many things that I'm gonna to introduce today, we're just at an introductory phase. I usually have a more in-depth workshop and or video that will cover these concepts um, more clearly or more holistically. So, uh, you know, just let me know how I can help you. Um, right, so moving beyond this concept of reproducibility and projects. Okay, gotcha. Um, a way that you create reproducible code is by using this concept called literate coding. So in the Python world, you may be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. That's an example of literate coding. In the R world, you may have heard of R Markdown or R Notebooks, also literate coding. In reality, both of those notebook systems are multilingual. You can write R code in Jupyter. In fact, Jupyter stands for Julia, which is a programming language, Python and R. And you can use R to manipulate R and Python and SQL. So you don't have to use um, Jupyter for Python or R for or R Markdown for R. <clears throat> but those, all I'm saying is those are two notebook examples of literate coding. And what happens is the, why you use these notebooks is it becomes a compendium record of your work where you can integrate your prose or natural language with your actual analysis code. I'll show you an example in just a minute. But what it means is you can more fully explain what you're doing. You can even write executive summaries and generate different kinds of reports. Um, so I hope to make that a little bit clearer. And we do all this because reproducibility of literate coding techniques within our studio projects with version control enables workflows that are reproducible. They're easy to share through Git and it decreases your dependency on using the mouse excessively because that cut and paste process, while super handy, is not reproducible. It's really hard to document. Well, I cleaned my data in Excel and then I pasted it over to um, maybe Tableau and then, I, and then I, I created a Tableau output and I copied it and I pasted it over into an Adobe product and I cleaned up my chart over in Adobe. Every time you're cutting and pasting, you're effectively breaking a reproducible chain. And then when you look back at that, you being your biggest reproducible client, in other words, I mean, of course you wanna share your work and you wanna be transparent and clear about it, but the person who's most likely to wanna to know what the details are are you, because once you separate by time, you're gonna forget stuff. So we're gonna use uh, what are called R Markdown files to demonstrate a lot of what we just talked about. And let me just do a quick demo right now. And then, um, and then we will get into the guts of, of doing more with R. But I want to cover a couple things here first. I want to cover projects, ingesting data, and R markdown files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And I'm connected to a remote computer. Uh, Duke gives everybody at least one free remote Windows computer, or it could be a Linux computer if you prefer. <clears throat> and so I like to do this demonstration on a computer like that because it's, it's clean and it's not full of all my little preferences. And you may see stumbling blocks that you are also faced with. So you will have already installed R, and I'm going to go click on this R Studio button, and you'll see um, if you haven't seen this before, this is the way RStudio works. It presents initially three quadrants. This is sort of the environment panel. This is the files panel. This is just another view of your file system, very much similar to in Windows. Here's a, you know, my file finder where I can go from pictures to downloads, whatever. I, I can navigate all of that here. I can add packages to this um, R installation by the packages tab. So I think I've already added this, but for example, there's a package called skimmer that I can click on and just click install and that will automatically install the skimmer package. And I'll get some information over here in what's called the console. 
That's this part right here, right? Um, now in the console, it's effectively, it's direct access to R, which you can think of as just a big calculator, right? <clears throat> like any computer, but um, so I could type, for example, five times five and get a response. And the response is, and I'll make this font bigger in a minute so you can see, but the response says 25. And if I decided to use my assignment variable, I could type answer, create an object name, hold down my alt. Uh, let's see, why did that not work? Um, there it is, alt dash, which types out my assignment variable, um, any kind of expression I wanted to, 10 times, 33, right? And then over here in the environment area, it's going to tell me what environment, what, what objects I have in my environment, and it'll give me a glimpse of the initial value of those objects. So in this case, it's telling me the entire value of that object because it's very simple. It's just 333. But I could um, I could create something else. Let's call it um, let's call it um, I'm going to call it uh, length dimensions, All right. and, uh, and I'm going to make that an array of numbers, sequence uh, numbers two through through uh, 500 by uh, five. Let's see what happens there. And now I've got this length dimensions variable, and it's, you can see that it's telling me it's a numeric, um, it's a numeric vector that has a hundred elements, and then it's giving me the list of elements. If I wanted to see the value of either one of those two things in my console, I could just type the name of it. So answer equals 330, length dimension, and it's um, tab completion. So I get that. And then I can demonstrate for you one of the nice values of R is that it enables something called vectorized math, right? So I can take, take answer, and I can multiply answer by length dimension. And it's going to multiply 330 by 2, and then 330 by 7, and then 330 by 12. And it's going to work its way through the whole list. And if I wanted to, I could assign that to a new variable, a new object name. Now, typically, people will um, not do all of their work in the console because they want to. Um, keep track of their work and refer back to it. So let me set something up here. First off, I'm gonna introduce, uh, demonstrate the idea of projects to you. I wanna start a new project. I'm gonna click on new project. Um, I don't need to save this. I'll just click don't save. And by the way, it says don't save dot our, our data there. Um, for those of you who are a little bit farther beyond, I recommend to you, this is not super important to the people who are just seeing this for the first time, but I recommend to you that you go under global options and uncheck restore at startup, uncheck previous, uncheck restore our data and change this save workspace to never. That's what I do all the time because if it's doing all those restorations, you're sort of setting yourself up for, a, for missing steps that need to be reproducible. Right? You want to create a situation where the script from beginning to end always generates your output. So um, ask me more about that if, if you're interested. But let me create a thing where I, I'm going to create a new project. And it gives me some options. I can grab uh, GitHub repositories, but I'm just going to do a new directory, or I could turn an existing folder on my file system into an R project. I'm gonna do a new project. I'm gonna call it hello world. I'm gonna give it an underscore there. And um, if you haven't clicked on this browse before, a lot of times you have to find a root project directory where you wanna put stuff. Um, but I've got a little tilde there, which is, which is an abbreviation for the root directory. But if I click on browse, just so you can see that should be in my case, the documents directory of my projects. So I'll click on create project and it'll do a little bit of churning. Now, this is my setup project. So I wanna, I'm gonna minimize this for just a minute and do a little bit of background setup. 
I'm going to go into my documents folder. I have a hello world that I used before, and I have some data in there. So I'm going to copy that data and I'm going to put it into my hello world. And let's just dig into that so you can see what's there. Um, there's a small little comma separated value um, file in there that if I click open, uh, you can see the comma separated values. Right? There's the the, the variable titles are the first line. And then the, you know, the, the, this comes from a data set called Star Wars. So under name, the first observation is Luke Skywalker. And Luke Skywalker is 172 centimeters tall. Uh, he weighs 77 kilograms and he has blonde hair. All right, that's my data set um, that I just moved into a folder inside of my RStudio project, right? So if I want to open up my RStudio project, I could click on this little link right here, Hello World, which is an rproj file. And that'll launch me into RStudio. I'm pretty, I mean, you could go back and forth either way. Um, I think I may have just created a, a second instance I did. So I'm going to close one of these because um, I don't need two instances. But there's that same data, right? Now, a stumbling block for a lot of people, it's super important, is how do I ingest the data that I want to that I want to work with? So let me just note to you that there's a button up here that calls says import data set. And if I click on that, I can import SPSS data, SAS data, Stata data, Excel data. Or there are two different ways to import text data. A CSV file is text data. Um, and then dumps me into a wizard, right? So I'm going to. By the way, I always choose the second option. There's the base R option. I'm always preferring myself to not use the base R option because it feels a little old school to me. Um, so I'm gonna click on that and it throws me into a data wizard. It's gonna do its best guess, uh, which I need to browse to my data. That's small. And there it shows me a preview of the data. It tells me the data type of the, of the vectors, right? So I have a character vector and some floating point vectors and um, another character beta vector. And I can change these if I wanted to, but it has to make sense, right? Um, this double could be integer. Uh, it wouldn't make any difference. I'm going to change it back to double. Um, and then what happens is all of that code gets written down right here, right? So if, for example, I needed to skip 10 lines of, of the data set, I could just put in some information about skip. And when I hit tab, it's going to write the code for me over here. And then I can use this code that it wrote for me in my, um, in my script. So let's just come back to that. Let's just cancel that and come back to that. Let's talk about scripts, right? R Markdown Notebooks. Easiest way to get started is to click on this little down arrow and choose R Markdown, R Notebook. R Notebooks and R Markdown are very similar. Um, this is mostly just for development where this is for more of a production orientation. Like now that I know what analysis I want to do, I want to generate slides, or I want to generate a dashboard, or I want to generate an ebook. You're going to do a lot of that from R Markdown. But if you're just getting started, you're just developing your analysis, easy enough place to start is with this thing called an R notebook. And that's going to divide my slide, uh, quadrants. Now I have four quadrants. And the top quadrant here is my R Markdown notebook, right? And to be honest with you, I no longer really need my console anymore. So I have a habit of just minimizing that. And then <clears throat> if you start off with a notebook, how easy is it to convert that to a markdown? At Great a question. Point? It's super simple. Um, you can actually click on this down arrow right here and choose a different thing to, to generate. So I might want to generate a Word file or a PDF or an H knit to HTML. That's going to change this line right here. Uh, this, this top section, these first four lines, is what's called a YAML header, just basic metadata about the document. And it also identifies the output type. 
Um, so if I change, you can see this, if I change this to knit to HTML, um, I'm gonna hit cancel. It rewrote some of that, but now it's in our HTML document. Um, if I change it to knit to PDF, it's gonna rewrite it again. I don't, I don't wanna follow through with those. So it's just writing code for me. I'm going to get rid of all that and type, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. And now I have to do it from memory. Um, output, I could have always started again, I'm sure. HTML notebook should, um, I think I have that right. It might have to be in quotes. I'm, I'm waiting for this knit button to change on me. It doesn't seem to be, I don't think it needs to be in quotes, so I'm gonna take it out. Um, other things that I would put in here, by the way, is I would put in author, John Little, and I would put in a date. Um, and you can put in, you know, a very simple date like Feb, uh, today's the 15th, or you can even write in little bits of R code right here if you surround it in backticks and type uh, an R function, like give me the system date. Um, so that's just the header. And then everything else that comes up here when you open up in our notebook is information about how to use an R notebook, okay? So because I've used these so much, I have all of this stuff memorized, my first step, and I'm not recommending this to you, my first step is to just delete all that and then start with my notebook. I'm gonna put that back and point out that there's more information about how to use Mark, R Markdown right there. There's information about how to use these things called code chunks. Remember I said literate coding was this issue of where you're interspersing natural language with analysis. So this is my analysis. This is an example of a code chunk. And the rest of this stuff is my natural language where I'm writing out not in cryptic little comments preceded by hashtags, but I'm writing out my actual words that I wanna be expressed here. So this comes up every single time. There's also a help document right here on um, our Markdown quick reference. If I click on that, it'll tell you how to do some of the um, structural and editor changes that you can make, how you can make something bold, like for example, wrapping it in italics. Now at this point you might be thinking, oh my God, this is so 1970s. So, um, let me not, let me not um, freak you out too much. There is this little icon right here for newer versions of our studio. It's been around for about a year now, this version, where if you click on that, you can get a visual editor like most of us are used to. And, you know, then I can, I can do the kind of typesetting, if you, I, I guess, formatting that you would, that most of us are used to. Like I can highlight the word chunk and make it bold and I can highlight the word placing and make it italics. And I can make this a link by clicking on wherever that link button is and put in a link to something like library. Let's see, I have to put in a full link. HTTPS colon slash slash library dot All right, click OK. So if you're just starting out, you might want to start out in the visual editor. I am going to admit to you that I, um, I really prefer Having used this so much, I am, I'm not at a point where I prefer the visual editor. I prefer this old style thing. But look at what we just did. We surrounded the word chunk with double asterisks, asterisks that made it bold. We surrounded the word placing with single asterisks. That'll make it an underline. And we surrounded the word cursor inside with some text that makes it a link and a link to this location. All right, so that's some of my pros. And here's my analysis. This is just straight R code right here with an onboard data set called cars. I'm gonna make a scatter plot with a plot function. And if I click on this green triangle, it will generate an inline image, some analysis, and put that in a report, right? So normally, again, how would I do this? I would go, I would put a, a, a second level header because this is gonna be my first level header in title. So I'm gonna call that uh, hello world. And then I'm gonna say uh, executive 
summary, this is an example of literate, literate coding. And I might, uh, I might bold that. And I might even, I, I, you know, I might actually also make that a link to, you know, the Wikipedia page on literate coding. Unfortunately, I don't have that URL memorized, so I'm not going to do that, but can be do. So I've got my executive summary. Another thing I would do is I would load my uh, library packages. So then I would create an, a code chunk where I would go up here to this thing and click the little R so that I have an R code chunk. Everything that you're about to see next is stuff that you could type out by hand. Or there is, if you read this information, there's a key shortcut for it. Speaking of shortcuts, if you go up here under help, keyboard shortcuts right there, there's tons of them. Um, so I'm going to load my library package with a function called library. And then the package I want to load is tidyverse. I can execute that code chunk. And I have, it gives me some information about tidyverse, it, which is really a mega collection of several packages. And so when I load the tidyverse, it tells me it just loaded these eight packages and what versions. And it also tells me that there, this is the long firm way of referring to the filter function in the deplier package, deplier being part of the tidyverse. But it's telling me that there's two functions called filter and that it's preferring deplier filter and masking stats filter. It's just telling me stuff that might be nice to know, but I largely ignore it. And if I wanted to, I could, um, use some of these options to turn like uh, show output only or uh, show nothing run code. I could do some of that stuff. Um, don't need to worry about that in too much detail. So just going on, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load some data, import some data. So let's go back to that discussion of data importing. Even though I mentioned to you that you can use this data wizard here, I usually do it from down here because it's relative to my RStudio project, right? My RStudio project called Hell World. So I'm going to right click on that um, file that's in my data folder. If, if I just go back here, I click on my data folder, right clicking on the file, and I'm sorry, left clicking on the file, and I'm going to click import data set, and I'm going to get some code down here that I can paste into my, into my script. Really, I just, I just did that so I could get this stuff. And then I'm gonna copy that into a buffer. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have to type that all out. I don't wanna have to memorize that. I'm just gonna call it small Star Wars data frame. And then I'm gonna put in my assignment variable, gets value from, and then I'm gonna paste that code that I just, had the machine generate for me using a read CSV function and a relative path file system, right? So I don't have, for example, note what I don't have here. I don't have C colon backslash users, backslash windows, backslash uh, John, backslash special project. Like if I had all of that stuff there, it would work, presume, assuming that that matches my file system. But if I share it with you, it's not going to work because you don't have the idiosyncratic nature of my file system. So it's really better. That's one of the reasons to use that RStudio project and to use that data wizard is it's writing for you things that will work on other on for other people, assuming they also have R RStudio installed on their system. Okay, and then. Um, I'm going to add another code chunk. It, it says in there that I've, um, where does it say? I think it says it down here. Can insert a code, code chunk with control alt I. Control alt I is the same as going up here. And I want to have a look at my data set. And then I might uh, actually say, so I might say, uh, I might, you know, choose to put some text in here. This is a subset. Of star of ggplot2 colon colon star wars data and have a look right and you know my 
My literate, my executive summary may also include, um, I might say, um, characters get larger at characters tend to have more mass as they correspondingly um, gain height. That's a strange sentence, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. So here I'm gonna, um, well, I, I might, this, this would get a little complicated, but I could, if I had it in order, actually, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just put this lower. I won't complicate my executive summary. I'll, uh, I'll put in a visualization and I'll put it here because it'll, it'll follow in a linear order. So here I'm gonna say small Star Wars. Let's see what we get so far. Let's go up here and click run all. And there's my data frame. And I might, to generate my visualization, we're not gonna to get to all of this today. I'm going to do a, show you a quick visualization. And we'll talk about visualizations more tomorrow. Um, point. So let's run it all again. And now I have sort of the, the initial guts of my report. And I'm going to click knit. It's going to ask me to give it a file name. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call it um, first report or draft report and click save. And then it will, when I click save, um, it will put that file right there. And um, yeah, and you'll notice that this button went back to preview. That's all controlled by that. So now I have my report, which I can, for reproducibility points, I can click restart all, run all chunks. That's going to clear out this environment variable, clear out all of these um, outputs, and then run everything. And if it runs from beginning to end, it's going to also generate a derivative report that's identified up here in line five. And then I can share that report with anybody. If I want to share it as an MS Word file, I can share it as an MS Word file. It would require a little more um, manipulation and formatting for it to be a pretty MS Word document. But um, Nonetheless, I have a derivative, I have two derivative reports now, and I can share these with other people. Um, and then I can go up here and choose which thing I want to knit at which time. All right, so that, that process of rendering a report is often referred to as knitting. All right, so that's the sort of setup, the very basic setup of how you use RStudio to generate code that goes inside of, in, at least in my case, since I'm using an R Markdown uh, notebook, the code goes inside of the, the code chunks. And I can run them out of order if I want to, but it's easy enough to run them all from beginning to end with just run all. Okay, so um, let's, let's, um, Let's, let me check back with my slides here. We'll get into the, the real manipulation. We've learned how to import data. We've learned a little bit about RStudio projects, literate coding, and uh, importing data and manipulating data. But let's learn more about the manipulating data because in reality, for any kind of data project, um, this, this was written up some time ago, now four, five, six, seven years ago, uh, someone projected that for any data project, 80% of it, give or take, is going to be just data manipulation. So we all want to get the output of that, um, that statistical model, or we want to see the pretty graph. And we will spend time on those things. But you can't do any of that unless you have data that's well-formed. And getting your data that is typically messy in the real world into a well-formed uh, shape takes a lot of wrangling and a lot of time. And that's what we're going to learn next is we're going to learn these deplier verbs on how to wrangle our data. Okay, so I want to go back to my slides if I can find them. 
And I want to bring you all with me. Go back to my slides. And that brings us to deploy. So what I'm going to do uh, probably at this point, well, I want, to, I want to open up the floor for some specific questions for people who did advanced work. And then I'm going to explain Deplier and the data wrangling that Deplier enables with new data that you haven't seen before, but I'm going to show you how to download all of the stuff that we're going to do. But uh, I will give other, ch other chances first, but I would like to sort of gently pause and ask, for people who did the prep work, and you don't, it's fine with me if you didn't, but for those, let's privilege those who did. Um, do you have any questions specifically of stuff that you worked through that doesn't make any sense that could help me focus what I'm gonna say now? Could you go a little bit into how to link the files from the GitHub that you posted and actually bringing those in? I was unable to, Kind of link directly out. I was able to pull up the GitHub, but I ended up having to like copy and paste into a new document that I created in R. So yeah. I know there's probably a better way to go about it, but I just couldn't figure it out. Uh, I got, I, yeah, I get it. Um, and this is complicated a little bit because of Git. And um, Yes, let me go over that because we're all going to do that anyway. Let me find my, where did I put my, um, there it is. Here's my R screen. And let's do all this together. We're going to download these two things, this and this. All right, so I'm going to open up I went to, um, this is my GitHub repository. I went to this URL, yarfun underscore flipped. And then I'm looking for this green button, which brings up a context menu. Now, for those of you who have Git installed, and you remember when I showed RStudio projects that you could use version control projects, this is the information you would paste in. But not everybody has Git installed and we're still introductory. So let's just do, even though it's slower, let's do the always works method, which is to click on this download zip button. And that's gonna download that into wherever you have set as your download directory. I'm gonna do the same thing with the other um, repository. And these are the exercises that I'd like to cover in the remainder of today. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna click on this green button and I'm gonna click download zip. Now in Windows it, and Chrome, it's easy enough to click on one of these context menus and you can get this thing that says show in folder. Um, the exact steps of what you do at this point kind of vary. Where does your browser download stuff? Go there. And then you, what you're gonna find is that you have two, um, well, you see that I have several copies of this, but you have copies of the two things that we just downloaded and it's a zipped compressed folder. Now you can double click and look into that zip compressed folder without uncompressing it, but I want you to expand it because we may save back into it. And so on Windows, the way to do that, um, as long as you don't have any extra software installed is to right click on it and choose extract all. So I'm gonna put this on my desktop. I can find it, desktop. And on Macs, I think on Macs you can just double click on it, but I wanna stress, it's really important that you expand these folders. Don't just look into them. You need to expand them. If you don't expand them, you won't be able to write back into them. So extract all. Oh. I put that in there, shoot, I didn't mean to put that there. I'm gonna do it one more time. Well, I'll just move this to my desktop, desktop. Okay, now let me minimize everything and I should have these two folders right here on my desktop. And if I look at our fun, 
Remember I said I put all the slides in. You've now downloaded the slides. You've got all the exercises that are there that uh, you may want to work through. They include answers. Uh, some people like to work with the answers first. Some people like to challenge themselves and try to figure out the answer. Either way is good with me. But here in slides, there are two PDF versions of the slides and there's uh, an HTML version. Uh, well, there was, oh, right there. Slides part one, it's got the little Chrome HTML extension. Um, but we're gonna go into, um, also let's double check here, exercises. Because what I wanna do is I wanna open up this project. I wanna find this rproj file. Some of you won't have the, out the, the view that I have. Let's, let's do medium icons. It'll look like that. That's an rproj file. It says intro, intro to r underscore exercises. And if you hover over it, it's an r project. If you double click on that, it will launch into our studio as a new project. Now, these are stumbling blocks, these things that I just covered. So uh, the question, what I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who asked the question, but um, if I didn't fully answer the steps on how to download the GitHub stuff, please let me know. Okay, so if there are other questions, let's, hear them, but what I would like to propose, unless you unmic or chat in, is that I'm going to um, talk about Deplier. So you should at this point see on your screen a slide that says Deplier, a grammar of data manipulation. And so Deplier is one of the, there's gotta be at least eight packages that get loaded when you load the tidyverse libraries. And it's all about data wrangling. Um, tomorrow we'll talk about pivoting long and pivoting wider. That's an example of data wrangling. But there are steps before that that you wanna know about. The other thing to point out is that with tidyverse packages, if you know a tidyverse package, so deplier or ggplot2 or per, you know, the list goes on. You can almost always find documentation with this um, format, deplier.tidyverse.org. So if I click on that, the nice thing about this documentation is it's online, it's easier to read, even though you can get it on board in your R Studio. And the other nice thing is Tidyverse documentation is pretty much consistent across packages. So you can click on this word called references and you'll get a link to all of the functions in that package. So if I want to know more about nesting, nest join function, um, I can read more and there's usually examples at the bottom. Okay, so going back to my slides. Uh, here, the, what I were referred to as the five deplier verbs, even though in this table, I actually have six verbs. Um, the first three we're gonna cover are subsetting a data frame, which is a rectangular grid, looks a little bit like an Excel spreadsheet, just rectangular data, a data frame made up of vectors of information. So we can use the filter command to subset by rows, that makes it smaller. We can use the select command to subset by columns, and we can use the arrange command to order the rows by a variable in a column. I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. We also have a function called mutate and a function called summarize. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But filter looks a little bit like this, right? So if you were to paste this, if you had loaded tidyverse in your R and you paste that code, it will work. It's gonna take the Star Wars data, set, data frame and then filter the variable eye color. Notice there's a double equal sign there for equivalency where eye color, which is a character vector, has the value orange because you can have different eye colors, right? You can have blue, brown, whatever. We just wanna see where the eye color equals orange. That's how you would write that. That code will work if you've loaded Tidyverse, that code will work in your console or in your script right now. 
And so visually, right, this dark top row is your table headers. And then it's a four row data set. And, you know, pick a column, maybe this one is eye color, where eye color equals orange, and maybe that's just these two. And then we're going to subset that data frame. So it's going from a four row data frame to a two row data frame. Similarly, uh, we can use the select variable to subset by columns. And there's a lot of helper functions to, um, <clears throat> to enable sophisticated column selection, but just very simply, you can identify a column by its column name or by its position, or even create a, um, uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know what word I'm searching for here. Create um, create a an array of columns. I guess is the word I'm trying to look for. So this is saying select columns two through four, or you can combine these two. Right? I want to collect select columns name through mass. Maybe there's a, a variable called height that's in between these two, and I want to select column ten, and I want to select column seven, and I also want to collect select columns four through six. Right? You can combine all those. Depends on your purposes, of course, but in the in the visual, we're going from a four column data frame to a two column data frame. And then <clears throat> arrange is a way to sort, right? So you can arrange by eye color. And if eye color is a alphabetic character vector column, like has blue and brown and yellow and orange, it's gonna sort alphabetically in ascending alphabetical order A through Z. But if you use the descend function to surround eye color, it's going to be reverse alphabetical order. And if you have a numeric uh, column, it's the same thing, right? Um, it's sorting by, I don't know what it is, UTF codes or whatever, something in the background that we don't want to worry about too much. Um, but <clears throat> if it's if it's column of, of mass, which is numbers, of uh, measured in kilograms, by default, the person that has a mass of one kilogram is going to be listed first, and then the last person or character in, the, in our case, um, who is Jabba the Hutt, who weighs like 1,500 kilograms, um, he's going to be listed last. And if I had wrapped mass and descend, then of course it would reverse the order. All right, let's just take a look at those again. Please unmike or ask a question or throw it in the chat if that's not clear. But let's let me try and give you a demo. You should now see my um, RStudio client. And I'm going to make some more changes to make this easier to see. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this, uh, this file called O1A Deplier. And I'm going to choose answers so that I, I don't have to type so much. But if you wanted to challenge yourself today or later, start off with the one without answers and see if you can answer these without the prompts. And so I'm going to open, I'm going to click on that. It's going to open it up into my editor. And the other thing I'm going to do just to make all of this easier to see is I'm going to make some changes that I don't think you should have to do. I'm going to change the font size to 150%. And I'm going to make it so that that's um, the only thing you see. If that's not large enough, let me know. I'll make it larger. Uh, but I'm going to start off here by running the first code chunk, which is loading library packages. And you'll notice that at line 23, the first thing that happens is it's installing a package called Gapminder. I don't usually put install functions in my code chunk because you only have to install something once. So if you have a script, if you know a little bit more about R and you're just trying to learn a little bit more, if you have a script that has install packages in there, you can comment that out because you only have to install it once. You have to load it every time, but you only have to install it once. So it's just taking up time in your script if you have it running constantly. But in this case, since I don't know where y'all are coming from, go ahead and install it. That's why it was in there in line 23. Now that I have that, 
uh, Gapminder has has a um, has a function in there called Gapminder. Uh, so if I wrote that out long form, um, it would look like this, and that is a data frame of 1700 rows and six columns. And if I highlight that and hit control enter, I can see it that way. I see the first, first 1700 rows. I can scroll through the first thousand rows up to, the, up to the hundredth screen of 10 rows. And I could scroll left and right if it was taking up more of my screen, there would be little arrows allowing me to go back and forth. Um, but, I'm using the glimpse command here just because, oh, notice that it also says right there, 1700 by six. Um, but the glimpse command is, is generally a good way to look at particularly large data sets. It kind of turns your data frame on edge, but it tells you some stuff that's easier to see. It gives me the name of my six columns in the first, uh, in the first column. And then it tells me their data type. So I have two factor data types, which is for categorical data. I have an integer data type for year. I have a double or a floating point, decimal point variable called life expectancy or life exp. I have another integer for pop for population. And I have another double for um, GDP per cap, right? So I'll oftentimes look at that. I'll use glimpse just to get a sense of what my data is. And then you can see there's a little preview of each vector. And that's the thing about a data frame is that the vectors in a data frame all have to have a consistent data type, right? So for example, where this says 1952, I can't have the word John as one of the elements in year. It's just not going to work. Um, but moving on to those three, those first three verbs that we just talked about, um, select, filter, and arrange. So the goal is let's subset um, the Gapminder data frame so that it only displays uh, the year and population. So I'm using select and I'm putting in year and pop, right? Notice if I just run line 48 without the pipe, control enter, I'm wanting to just create a subset of year and pop. And I can do that that way. And that gives me 1,704 rows by two. Now, that does not permanently change the Gapminder data frame, right? I can type Gapminder here. If I run both of these together, I've got two different data frames, but the difference is the first one, while it's subsetted to two, only display two columns, if I go back and look at Gapminder, it's still a six column data frame, right? So if I wanna make this permanent, I've got to assign that to an object name. So I'm gonna call it Gap small. And I'm going to put in that assignment variable. And then I might, and then if I want to look at it, I'm going to have to call it again, gap small. So I can run this code chunk. And now, because I have something called gap small, I can refer to this again and again and again. I still have not changed the original data, um, the, the original data that, that came, came to me. Um, <clears throat> All right, so that's select, subsetting down by columns. Similarly, you can select, you can subset by rows. So in this case, I'm saying where year equals 1952. And you'll notice as you scroll through this data frame that 1952 occurs quite often because this is population for countries taken every, I think every five years, right? So actually I'm gonna select to where year, no, double equals for equivalency, where year equals 1987. And that is going to turn that 1700 data frame down to 142 rows. So I've subset by rows. I still have all six columns. And of course I could combine my two um, functions that I've learned so far to make a more complex data sentence, select country through year. Um, plus pop. So this is, isn't doing much, but um, right, I now have a smaller data frame. Uh, but that's selecting by year and by subsetting by column and by row. 
And then um, a lot of times you want to arrange, and we talked about that. You can arrange uh, population. By default, it will sort alpha um, in ascending order, right? So if I, if I run this data frame, um, here I've got the lowest population country, which is um, a country in Africa and that existed at least in 1952. And um, if I, I, again, I've only got a thousand rows here, but it goes up through Cameroon, which has a population of about 9 million, 9.2 million. Um, and then it's nice to know that you can subsort, right? So if I wanted to sort in descending order by continent, and then where there are matches, subset that in reverse numerical order, I could do that that way. And I would get something like this, where Oceana is the last alphabetically, the last continent name uh, in alphabetical order, right? So then I'm subsetting by year, 2007 comes first, then 2002. But what if I wanted New Zealand to come first, right? I could just further subset this or further subarrange this to uh, subset by, um, to arrange by country. And oops, sorry. That would have to also be in reverse alphabetical order. And now New Zealand comes. So anytime there's a match, um, you go to the next, um, the next argument. All right. So uh, next up, we have mutate and summarize. Well, let's do mutate first. First, let's take a quick look at the visual aid in hopes that that will make things a little clearer. So here, mutate, in the case of mutate, it's often described as you're generating a new variable, but you could also alter an existing variable with mutate, All right? So if I take Star Wars and then mutate, I'm gonna create a new variable called big mass, where big mass gets value from the existing variable called mass. This is my expression, mass times 100, right? So I'm taking, if, there, if this was a two, variable data frame and I run big this, I now have a three variable data frame where I have name, mass, and big mass, right? And then you can put all kinds of um, expressions in there, right? In this case, a mathematical expression that takes mass divided by height. Uh, well, it's, it's height divided by 100, which is the, divi which is the divisor to mass. Um, I'm sorry, but first it's uh, put to the second power. Um, but um, you may also mutate things where you're mutating um, character strings. And in that case, I'll just note that because R is a data first programming language, it's sort of naturally easier to manipulate numbers uh, more so than it is to manipulate text. But manipulating text is totally possible. It generally means that you're manipulating text with what are called regular expressions, which we're not going to talk about today. But that's what's happening here. I'm using a function that is uh, part of the Stringer library, which is part of the Tidyverse, that enables regular expressions. But in this case, it's doing something very simple. It's just making the variable hair color all uppercase. So if blonde was listed in lowercase, in this case, string to upper is going to make all those letters uppercase. And then I'm using a string under source C for concatenate or, or combine. And I'm making a nickname. So if hair color was blonde, this person would, would now have a nickname variable, big blonde, right? That's all that's saying. Now, that can be a little bit confusing. So if it doesn't make any sense to you, just ignore it. Let's have a look at um, going back here, hopefully, to the to the R Studio. Here we're using mutate. We're going to take um, the life expectancy column and we're going to multiply it by two. 
And we have a, a round there, which is gonna round off the, the answer. Let's go ahead and do two of these just so we can see the difference. Mutate life uh, double equals life L-I-F-E expectancy times two. So this one, one of them is rounded and one of them is not. And uh, there's the difference right there. So that's rounded to, to two. Uh, and this is the full number. And of course, I could, I could give that round a, uh, I could give it an argument uh, that would allow me to change the, the length of the, the number of the value there. I could also, if I wanted to, um, you know, combine that, of course, with select so that I can do uh, country and right. Um, so that's where that um, that's what mutate is doing. Um, if for some strange reason I wanted to overwrite the value of life expectancy, I could just write in another mutate function and take life expectancy, take the original variable and say that it equals um, life expectancy, oops, life expectancy divided by five. And then I'm just gonna overwrite the original in a case like that because I'm using this assignment variable here. Um, so I really should have read that as gets value from, gets value from, right? So that's what mutate is doing. And that brings us to count, group by and summarize, uh, which I'll try and introduce to you next, unless there are questions. Go back to my slides. All right, so I like to introduce, um, let's go back a couple slides here. So summarize and group by are really powerful. And it's basically used for getting column totals and column subtotals. Um, but the syntax is a little funky. So I like to start by introducing count which is really a specialized function of summarize, right? So um, I think it will help demonstrate what's happening here. But if I had a variable called gender and it might have values like masculine and feminine, and I wanted to see how many rows in my data frame had the value masculine and how many had the value uh, feminine, I could write that expression right there, that data sentence, Star Wars, and then count gender. And it's gonna give me back a, a table of that count. So let's take, take a quick look at that. Well, I got the disconnect there. We're, we're gonna ignore, right? where's count? Counts up here. So using this example, if I look at um, Gapminder, I have a variable called country. And you can see this is such a big data frame with repeating data values. It's really kind of hard to tell what other countries are listed other than Afghanistan, right? Well, I tend to just use count, but there is a more specialized function called distinct. But um, if I type count and run this code chunk, it's going to give me and in this case, it's a very clean data set. It's gonna give me information that says there are 12 rows of Afghanistan, 12 rows of, Al of Albania, 12 rows of whatever. And it reduced that data frame to 142 rows. Um, just to bring in Star Wars, that example that we were looking at a minute ago, count gender. I run both of those at the same time. In the case of the Star Wars one, I've got 17 characters that are feminine, 66 that are masculine, and I've got four NAs. By the way, in terms of dealing with NAs, you can do stuff like this, drop NA, gender, and then 
and um, then I'm limiting my count that way. I can also, uh, I could of course arrange this if I wanted to, arrange where uh, in descending order by n, right? Um, so that's count. That's an example of column subtotals, right? The column is gender. The values in, in gender are either masculine or feminine. And if I want a subtotal of how many masculine, how many feminine, I just do that, All right? So back to the slides, summarize, oops, summarize is, the, is really the function that count is built off of. And it's usually worked in combination with group by. But bear with me here for a minute. Notice that I'm using spelling summarize with an S. That's because R was developed in New Zealand. And they, I guess, predominantly use the British version of the British spelling, British English, spelling for British English. Um, but they support both British English spelling and American English spelling. And so you can use either. And if you're lazy like me, when you're using the type ahead buffer, summarize with an S comes before summarize with a Z. So I tend to use what comes first, but it's handy if you're, uh, you know, for example, if you're used to spelling color with a U, you can spell color with a U um, when you're using the function that has the color argument. Okay, so in this case, I'm taking the Star Wars um, data set and I'm getting some column totals on um, things like, the minimum height and the maximum height, and how many distinct entries of height are there, things of that nature. Let's take a look at that. And then we'll introduce group by. So here is, there's, there's my American English spelling. If I take Gapminder and I want to sum all of the values in population, of course, this doesn't make any sense because this is population for 1952 and population for 1957 and population for 1962. And accumulating these doesn't really make much mathematical sense, but it just demonstrates how you can sum a column, right? I can summarize pop by using the summarize function, creating a new variable name, sum of pop, gets value from, and then using an R function called sum to sum pop. Right, that's this right here. So if I do that, I get this really big number, which by the way is a little hard to read, but it's a uh, double floating point data type. So you can do math on it. Um, if you really needed to read it, there are different things you could do. For example, use that function to make it easier to read. Um, but now it's a character data type and you can no longer do math on it, or you'd have to convert it to integers or numeric in order to do math. Uh, but notice another difference here is that in this case, I'm getting a column total, but what if I don't want totals, uh, uh, the whole total, what if I just want totals by each year, right? So there I'm gonna use, that's where the group by comes in. That's what count effectively does for me is it makes it so that I don't have to write the group by function. Uh, but it, of course, it's a specialized and therefore limited function. So let's take a look at this. I've got Gapminder. I want to group by year. So this is my subgrouping. And then I got a subtotal for every one of these years by the variable population. That's what's happening there. Group by year, summarize, total pop, which is the sum of pop. Right. And then I use that special function to make it pretty. So it was easier to read, but I, I end up with a 12 row data frame where the last there was data for was 2007. And we have a number of, there's looks like there was six, 6 6.25 billion people in the world, according to that data frame as of 2007. Um, right. So that is, that is the bulk of the deplier verbs. 
I'm not sure what I've forgotten to tell you, and I'm not sure what you don't understand, but you've been uh, very generous and quiet. So I want to open the floor to make sure you have a chance to clarify things that don't make sense. And while you're thinking of your question, I want to tell you two things. One is um, I have a survey of evaluation survey that you might want to fill out. I would be happy for your response. You'll get an email uh, that has this link in it, uh, but I'm going to put it in here. The other thing is I'll tell you what's going to happen tomorrow is we're going to talk about how to make visualizations, how to pivot data wider and longer, how to do what are called left joins, which is to join two different data frames by some common value. And of course, you can join data frames that don't have common values. That's a different thing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, how you, how you manipulate a simple linear regression model in R. Um, so I want to wait for questions. And so I'm going to pause for a minute, but then I'll have some other comments. Does the order in which your statements within a piped group of code matter? So for instance, like in SQL, you have to have your select and then from and then group by. But I noticed in the example here, you specified the, the data, a gap minder, then you grouped, and then you did your aggregation. If you yeah. swapped lines 138, 139, does it make any difference? Um, group by has to come before summarize. But that might be the only situation where order matters with respect to the other verbs that we talked about. So now that I've done summarize, I could still mutate, right? I could create um, big pop equals uh, total pop times two. Um, well, that didn't work. Oh, that's because of um, I did that fancy thing. Oops. Um, <clears throat> but it does matter with summarize because in order to get subtotals, you have to tell summarize what is the object that you want to subtotal, right? Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hey, yes. I have a question about that pipe function that um, percent uh, larger than percent that one. I yeah. kind of confused. Sometimes it seems shows some parallel uh, relationship between the two lines. And sometimes it seems like a level by level thing. So I kind of confused about that. So, okay, let me just ask you, are you saying like, for example, you can have two pipes on one line like that? Yeah, I think so. Because some are still not very clear about that pipe function. Okay, good. Thanks for the question. Um, so, um, oh, and I see that some questions came in on chat, so I will get to those. Um, so the pipe function, uh, the reason to go to new lines really is just for ease of reading, right? Um, I mean, a general suggestion for when you write code is to try not to get longer than about 60 characters wide. Um, that's a real loose uh, rule of thumb. And if you violate that rule, you should not feel bad. But um, in my experience, code is generally easier to read if you can break it up. And now the pipe itself helps with that, but all the pipe is is a conjunction that, again, if you think in your head, it says, and then, so let's read this whole thing as if it were a data sentence. It says gap minder and then group by and then summarize and then mutate. So um, you could do it all on one line and you would get exactly the same response. Um, and the only difference would be, it would be a little bit harder to read. Um, But those two, th those two statements, those two data sentences, 
the one from line 137 and the one that begins 139 through 142 are gonna generate exactly these, the same output. And so there's nothing technically wrong about this. And the pipe does not really privilege um, anything. It really only serves as a way, to, as a conjunction, as a way to manage the flow of your data sentence. I hope that, I hope that yeah. answers the question. Thank you. And then whenever you want to, because it seems like in this notebook, you can deal with more than just one data set. But whenever oh, yeah. you want to deal with one and you, you always start with that data set's name, right? Yeah, yeah. The general convention is to always start with the data frame. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You can use other data sets. Um, you can load multiple data sets. We'll deal with some of that tomorrow. But for example, here we've got you know, three data, two different data sets, three different data sentences in one code chunk. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I see Morad asked a question on chat that says, is it possible to make a data set available for everyone by directly calling it an R or would people need to download the data first? So the, the answer to that is if the data are in a package that everybody can access, then everybody can access it, yes. But if it's data that's unique to you, they would need to call that. So for example, I think, um, I think if I just type data, I'll get a list of all of these onboard data sets that exist in R when you, or, or either exist in R or exist within packages that you have loaded, right? That's what just happened when I typed data as it threw me into this new tab. Um, so all of those data sets, if the people have these packages loaded, right, data sets they may already have. And we all loaded, um, we loaded Tidyverse, which included Deplier. So everybody's got band instruments and band membership available to them. I'm sorry, band instruments and band instruments too, and GSS Cat. Uh, but if they don't have that, let me just at least show you that there's a, yeah, you, you would either have to send them the data, but if you have the data, for example, on something like GitHub, um, a lot of times you can read the data from GitHub. So let's um, look in this GitHub repository and read in this data set right here. Let's take a look at it. You can see that it's a data frame of some maybe four, five variables. Um, it looks like it has something to skip. Line one needs to be skipped, but let me, I'm gonna click on raw to get a URL and I'm gonna copy that URL. So if your data are essentially, if your data are available on the internet, then uh, you wouldn't need to send them the data because I could do something like this. Foo data frame gets value from read underscore CSV and then put in that. And remember I said I needed to skip one line. So I'm gonna put in the argument skip. And uh, there, if you, you could put that same thing into your data frame and um, you should now have that, that data frame. And so you could share it that way. It could be mounted, um, at least on GitHub. I don't know if Dropbox and Box work that way or not. Um, they might, I've not tried that. I hope that answers that question. Let me know if, you're, if you have a follow-up. And I see that, um, oh, forgive, please forgive me, Timmy, Timmy Tayo asked the question, um, assuming you wanted to replace the NA instead of dropping it, what's the code replacement? Ah. So yeah, you can do a, there's a replace NA function. Um, so Star Wars, let's just, let's subset it down so it's easy to look at gender. So now we've got that and um, let's do this. First, we'll say filter where it is dot NA just to see what we've got. Uh, that didn't work. Oh wait, is dot NA uh, gender. 
So yeah, we've got a couple NAs in there and maybe we want to replace them. We want to replace them with um, mutate, or let's just double check, NA. Oh, uh, I was thinking there was an NA replace, but I don't think there is an NA replace. I think there's an NA if, which does something different, right? NA if allows you to, um, for example, if you had, um, although you could do it this way, let, let, let me at least answer your, <coughs> excuse me, at least answer your question. I could say mutate, um, I'm gonna call it new gender gets value from um, if else gender, well, actually I need to do a true false there. The easiest way to do a true false is to say is.na. So if that's true, then we're gonna call it um, 999. Well, let's, we'll make it numeric. And if it's false, we're just gonna call it gender. Oh, actually, sorry. Since this is character data frame, this is gonna to have to be um, character, so I'm gonna wrap it. So let's run that. That, you can see how that worked. Let's then, um, let's take, let's comment out this filter statement and then type count new gender. And we should see that we, we altered that to 999 and it has a value and there are four of them. Um, remember, work through those examples. It's a great way to learn, but I am more than happy to meet with you. Uh, a library function again. Uh -huh. so you mentioned that for every package, you only need to install the package once for your own oh. R Studio. But it's like for the um, notebook that for each project, you have to library, use that library of that function yes. for once, for one project? Um, not for the project, for the script, for the notebook, oh. right? So every, every script, the way I do it is I just, I just usually have a load packages statement at the top of each one of my scripts. So let's take a look at this O2AViz. If I open that up, you'll notice I've got that statement right there. And um, this EDA, uh, I've got three libraries loaded right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, so the way you, you, you prefer to use notebook rather than use the script itself. So the, the value of the notebooks to me is the ability to do the literate coding where you can be much more expressive using natural language to explain what's happening in the analysis inside the code chunks. Uh -huh. um, and that's also helpful because then I can, for example, I can generate slides like I opened the session with. All of those visualizations were manipulated from code chunks, but um, I could use words to explain the visualizations and I could, you know, I could keep all of that together. And that way, if the data changes, I don't have to rewrite the expression. I don't have to paste it into Microsoft Word or to PDF. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not going to tell you not to use a script. If you prefer to use a, a script, you know, you could just do it this way. You could library, um, if I spell it right, uh, tidyverse, and then say uh, Star Wars, and then say, um, uh, Star Wars. I'm just going to make a very simple visualization here. ggplot2, AES, height, mass, uh, g um, point. Now I should be able to save that and call it um, example.r, save, and it should show up right there. And um, if I run all of that, uh oh, something didn't. Why did that happen? Could not find function ggplot. Oh, that doesn't make any sense to me. It literally makes no sense to me. 
PG plot. Oh, that's because I, sorry, I, that makes sense. It's just called ggplot. Mm. I'll put my comment there. Um, I should be able to run that whole thing and get a visualization over here, right? Mm. So it's kind of a matter of personal preference. I would tell you that um, having to comment your code out like this um, and put messages to myself and others, that that tends, that that whole process in that it's not really natural language and you have to use comments in front of, front of things tends to promote being cryptic. And um, it's not a great way to document your code, um, but it's not wrong, right? Uh, yeah. it's just, from, from what I'm trying to teach, I'm trying to teach a reproducible method. And mm -hmm. I would tell you that the notebook is a better way to do that. Yeah, and it seems like the script only works for R, right? But if you use the notebook, you can also insert other chunks like uh, from like Stata or oh, yeah. other, right? Uh, I don't know about Stata, but you can definitely have other kinds of chunks, right? There's an R chunk. If I had if I had a Python compiler loaded, I could also include um, a Python chunk. And if I was grabbing data, maybe I would do that before these two manipulations. Um, trying to get my cursor to behave. Um, I could also insert a, an SQL chunk and do a, you know, pull data from a remote database. So yeah, the, the notebooks are definitely handy in many ways. Um, okay, thank you. Yep, sure thing. Okay, uh, I don't know, I'm interested in, um, formatting data, um, normalizing data before you get to use it. So can yeah. you say something about that? When do you, well, how do you determine if you have to normalize your data and what are the dangers of doing that? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, do you have an example of what kind of data you think you need to okay. normalize? Okay, I assume that I want to do a regression on, um, on like five variables. And one is reading 700, the highest is 700, and the others are like 0 0.1 and 1 and 2. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be honest, that is a more of a statistical question for which I don't have a good answer. I know that you could, for example, scale the, um, the big number to 1 uh, so that everything falls between the, the values of 0 and 1. So for example, let's take a look at this economics data frame, um, you'll see that there's some really big numbers in pop is way out of the norm of P saver yeah. and unemployment is much bigger than, is similar to PCE, but much bigger than unemployment. Um, and I'm gonna show you this economics long. And this is where someone has pivoted the data. But the point that I wanna show is that they, they also scaled the data so that all of these numbers now are between zero and one. And at least from a visualization standpoint, that makes it much easier to, um, to visualize ggplot, ggplot, AES um, date value of one, geom point AES, color equals variable, variable, let's see if I did that right. Yeah, um, so now you can see that the scale here on the left is between zero and one. And if, if that wasn't normalized, it would be much harder to see common trends because some of the numbers are so much larger Oops. So let's just take a look at the difference here. Here's the normalized plot, and here's the non-normalized plot. Um, and the, the, the nuance of the data for many of these variables just gets lost because the pop value is so much bigger. Um, on the other hand, um, 
when you look at a chart like this, and that, now I'm only talking, I don't, I'm not talking about the statistical implications, but just from the visualization implications, you have altered the scale. So it's much harder to look at this visualization and have any clue that the pop variable is considerably higher number than all of the other variables. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to display. And there, are, there, at least from a visualization point of view, there are ways to tell the visual story without normalizing the data, right? So for example, I could say facet uh, wrap um, uh, variable. Let's just double check how this shows up. Oh, hold on. That function's not right. Facet wrap. If I do that, now the, the scales are not right, but let me just double check some documentation so I write down the right thing. Here we go, scales, scales, scales equals three. Um, so now I've not normalized the data to itself and the scales are all different, but the trends can be appreciated alongside of, the, of its compatriot data, but still have a sense of the actual unit value of the data for each individual chart. So there are tons of trade-offs visually. There may be trade-offs statistically that I'm not able to express to you because I don't know the answer, but some of the graduate students um, that I talked about earlier in the program um, our graduate students who work on the work in the lab and man the chat or or staff the chat sorry um, they uh, they might have a better answer for the statistical implications of normalizing the data thank you